Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I'm so glad to be here and honored to have been invited uh, to participate. And I'm so excited to have this phenomenal panel here. And before we get started, I just wanted to get a sense of who's in the room. Um, so by show of hands, who here considers themselves a data scientist? Awesome. And who would like to consider themselves a data scientist aspirationally? Great. Um, and who works with data scientists or maybe manages, um, manages data scientists? Awesome. Great. So yeah, as Heather mentioned, there's just such a variety of things that we refer to by this broad term, data scientist. Uh, and we thought it would be useful to have a conversation about what it really means to be a data scientist. Um, you know, if you if you Google search data science, you get headlines like, you know, this is the hottest uh, career of the 20th century, 21st century. Um, it's the most promising job of 2019. Uh, you also get things like, you know, why there will be no data science job titles by 2029, and is it all a bubble? You know, so um, I'm excited to introduce our, our panelists. So um, we have Andrea Quintero, whose background uh, is in neuroscience as well. We actually have kind of an overrepresentation of neuroscience and cognitive science in this panel, which I'm not sad about. Um, Andrea is a business analyst, business intelligence analyst at T. Rowe Price. Um, we have Jennifer Thompson, uh, whose background is in uh, mathematics, and she has a master's of public health and biostatistics. Uh, she's now a data scientist at Devoted Health. Uh, we have Tammy Levy, who is, uh, her background is in digital media design, computer science. She's done a bunch of really interesting things and now is the VP of Insights and Analytics at Congregate. And uh, finally, we have Stephanie Storensen, whose background is in psychology and cognitive neuroscience. Uh, and she's currently a data scientist at Wayfair. Uh, and so to get things started, I wanna let, let them introduce themselves and um, maybe tell us a bit about what your day-to-day -day job is, is like and what skills you found most useful in allowing you to be successful in that role. All right, so um, I'm Stephanie. Um, I am currently, um, as uh, Morgan just said, a, a, d a data scientist at Wayfair. Um, at Wayfair, I work on the data science marketing team um, where I work on notifications marketing. Um, some, an example of what I do is working on um, email cadence. So if you're a, a customer at Wayfair, um, so Wayfair, if you don't know, is an e-commerce um, website where customers can come and buy home decor and um, things for their home. Um, and um, it really is a technology company at heart. Um, and if you're a customer and you come to Wayfair, you can sign up to receive our marketing emails, or if you download our app, you can sign up to receive push notifications. Um, and some of what I do is to try to figure out when um, and um, to who we should send those emails. Um, and for my day-to-day, -day, it, it really depends, I think, on the, the stage of, of the projects that I'm working on. Um, I think the kind of project work cycle spans from like ideation to collecting data, to looking at the data, to building models, uh, testing models, um, and then deploying models is, I think, the um, general product cycle. Um, and throughout that process, uh, it's a lot of uh, meeting with um, our business stakeholders. So I work with the marketing team, um, as well as engineers, um, as well as other data scientists. Um, so um, a lot of meetings with other people, um, collaborating with other data scientists uh, who might be working on different projects, but like maybe somewhat related, um, and then talking with our, our business stakeholders. So. Thank you. Um, my, tam uh, my name is Tammy. I am uh, from Congregate and just a little bit of context of what Congregate does. We're a gaming company. Video games is what we, uh, the space where we operate. Uh, we didn't really start as a company that makes video games. We distribute video games. So um, we had a, originally started as a platform on the web. So you can think of, you know, 2005, YouTube, uh, equivalent but for games. So you can go and just play uh, free games. And from there, now we do also publishing. So we uh, help developers who are making these games distribute. Um, and we, what I like to say is that we do all the boring stuff, including the analytics and the marketing and kind of all, all the business uh, operations and let the, the creative people build the games. And uh, now we also build, we have a couple of game studios that build games. So. It's a lot of, um, when you think about the, the type of data that we're working with, is a lot of customer analytics, a lot of behavioral analytics, 
a lot of uh, marketing analytics. So it's it's a pretty um, broad set of type of, of data that we're working with, but it's all kind of customer centric. Um, in terms of what I do is, uh, li late last year we decided that you know, as as many companies we're doing a lot of analytics, but we need to be better at it. And by better, I mean just more intentional. I think that it's very easy for teams and companies to just, I there's so many tools out there, so you can just start doing analytics and start doing data science without being intentional about it. So uh, I transitioned into this role of VP of Insights and Analytics to be intentional about the data and analytics and um, kind of this data world that we're operating in. So I oversee a pretty uh, diverse team uh, from data engineers, data scientists, data analysts. We're a very small team, so some, some of those roles is one person um, to uh, what we call product specialists, which is the people um, equivalent to a product manager on, on the games side. So it's um, what I like to say, it's, it's overseeing the end-to-end -end from what, do we, uh, what data do we collect, how do we process it, and how do we use it. Um, and in terms of um, kind of day-to-day, -day, there's really no day-to-day, -day, um, but if I'd say um, skills that, that have been helpful I think it's just uh, creative problem solving. I think that that's probably a common theme across uh, everyone in this room and uh, communicating because you are in this role that is very, uh, it, it's communicating with lots of different types of people from different backgrounds uh, with different kind of understanding of the data that you're uh, using and just having that um, kind of being able to go from someone who doesn't know anything about data uh, and they'll just believe whatever uh, you say because you're the expert to someone who's going to ask the nitty gritty questions. Thank you. Um, I'm Jennifer Thompson. Um, I just started working at Devoted Health in January, um, and Devoted is a Medicare Advantage insurance plan. And um, January is when we first started taking care of our members. So our goal is to serve our members like they're our family. And we just started taking care of members in, um, a couple, in a few markets in Florida as I joined the company. So right now, we are focused a lot on metrics, figuring out like what are we trying to measure? How can we get our operations in check? So we're doing a lot of analytics, a lot of metric setting. Um, as we progress and accrue data, we'll do more um, you know, complex modeling, statistical and machine learning, that kind of thing. Um, in terms of what skills have been most valuable, I think being able to zoom out and see the big picture. So if someone asks me for a specific query, like, hey, I need all the claims that you know fit XYZ criteria, I can give that to them, but also being able to zoom out and say, like, what problem are we really trying to solve? Is there a better way that I can, I can do this query for you, but also help work with you more closely in the long term to better solve this problem? Um, let's see, I wrote some notes here so I wouldn't forget. Um, also, healthcare is really complicated. <laughs> So I'm not sure if you guys knew. And um, so being able to quickly learn uh, not only our tech stack, which is largely new to me coming from an academic background, but also the terminology and the business language of healthcare. And um, being able to pick those things up very quickly has been an invaluable skill, so. Hi, everyone. Um, so I work at T. Rowe Price, which is an asset management firm. On the investment side, they've been doing modeling for a very long time, but I actually work on the distribution side, which is sales and marketing. And about two years ago, they um, decided to invest in data science. Um, the asset management world, the investment world, is slowly and surely buying data science um, with a lot, a lot of money. But um, so I was brought in because I come from an academic background, and so I can speak data science. I can also speak with the business side. And so what I do, one of the hats I wear, is to help make sure that the money that we're putting into these data science models is actually going to be used. Because a lot of people will ask questions and be like, I want to know, predict this, but if there's not a plan to implement that model, it was a lot of wasted time by the data scientists and a lot of wasted investment. So as this uh, two year, like I said, we, they created the center two years ago, so there's not process involved. So my job is actually to help create that process so we can make sure we have that full pipeline from deployment to actually saying there's a return on the investment. Um, as a data analyst myself, I'm also helping to create data visualizations to help the business understand their data to be able to make those better decisions um, over time as they learn to trust us and not just listen to their guts and 
see that the data has something additional to say. So I'll leave it there. Awesome. Thank you so much. So there's, I heard a lot of a lot of common themes here about you know, really being a data scientist and and being being able to gain insights from the data requires <laughs> problem solving, requires communication, creativity, um, and requires being deliberate in your choices of um, of, of how you're going to use use the data. Um, and so I. There wasn't a whole lot of talk about specific technical skills here, which I think is, is interesting and important. And so I wonder, a lot of us uh, who are going into or thinking about going into data scientists, I think it's easy to focus on, you know, what skills do I need? What, what techniques do I need? Um, and so if you could, what are your, your thoughts on kind of, are there skills that are absolutely necessary uh, for data scientists to have um, besides beyond that communication and, and deliberate problem solving? Uh, yeah, so I think that it's it's very interesting because there's there's a lot of boot camps and trainings that are hyper focused on that, and I think that at a high level, like you want to be acquiring those skills, uh, mainly like learn how to script and query data. So SQL, like understand the basics of SQL. Like that's that it's it's almost like um, being able to use Word these days. Um, so being able to access the data. Uh, learn some scripting language, but part of um, even when I am I am recruiting and I am talking to to people, like I don't really look at do they know R or they or do they know Python. I want to know that they do. Do they can they learn it? Because um, if you show that you've followed this path where you've picked up a scripting language and you can be fluent in it, if you're a smart person, you'll pick up a new one and you'll be fine. Like it'll take. A little bit of ramp up time, but you'll be able to get there. So it really is in terms of like hard skills. It's just showcase that uh, you have some, and that you can easily pick up anything that the company already is using. Because every company is going to be different, so you're not going to have all the the fluency and all the tools that that company is using. And uh, aside from that, it's like the the actual uh, stats and math and understanding behind it. But again, the way it's applied into different fields, I think it's very different. So you can't get super nitty gritty on a way of um, thinking about it because it, it goes back to the problem solving. If you have the basics, you're gonna be able to figure it out. Yeah, I kind of, um, I agree with that. So I have a, like most of us up here, I have a cognitive background. I actually, before this, I was a postdoc at Hopkins studying um, math anxiety in children is very different than marketing and investments. Um, how did I get my job? Um, what I told them is that I know how to learn. I know how to take abstract questions and put them into graphs, is essentially what I said. That's the skill that I have. I can learn the terminology. I can learn the assumptions of the field. What I bring to you is the ability to translate that and understand data and how data acts whether or not it's children doing math or whether it's people responding to emails, data essentially, in a sense, is the same, right? It's um, abstract, it's unstructured, and I have to take uh, apply questions and be able to interpret it and give it an answer. Um, and so that's what I think is my tool, um, though it's kind of still an abstract tool. That's a tool that I have that I can then apply to many places. But I also then have a specific skill set in statistics, and that's the, my specific niche that then I bring to my job. So there are some abstract things and then be good at like something really good so that they come to you and be like, I heard you were really good at Bayesian modeling. Can you help me with this? I think that's the way that I um, have given career advice and the advice that I got that I really appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah. And maybe along those lines, do you want to talk a little bit about what parts of your, your past experience and maybe previous roles really prepared you best for your, for your current role? Um, yeah, so I guess kind of going off the, like, what skills are generally useful for a data scientist and which skills I think transferred from my previous role. So um, I was uh, doing a PhD before transitioning into data science, and I think one of the the biggest things there was just learning how to ask questions and like how 
to ask the right questions and then how to use the tool set of like maybe machine learning or stats or visualization um, that we're just like digging around the data to, to answer those questions, which I think um, is one of probably the most important skills that I've carried with me like into, into um, being a data scientist because you can have a, a skill set of like knowing a various number of models and being able to go to like a Kaggle competition and apply those models to a specific constrained problem. But in the real world, you often have to figure out what the problem is and then how to approach that problem. And I think that's something like you can learn through a PhD program, you can learn through doing your own projects on your own and just asking questions. Um, so I don't think it's constrained to like any one particular background path to, to in order to, to do that before becoming a data scientist. But I think it is has been a very useful skill like in, in the job that is something that you don't often think about when you think about like if, if I was gonna do a program, like what are the, the necessary checkbox, like what are the necessary tools to look for? Um, that, that I think for me has been really helpful. The other piece maybe is um, just getting familiar with data manipulation and being comfortable doing that, even if it's not your the like favorite part of like it's not like the modeling part or producing a result part, but just being interested in, in spending time looking through data and looking for patterns in data. It might be time consuming and kind of drudge work, but um, if you like that part, I think it helps the job a lot too. I was actually going to say something really similar, but I'll expand on it a bit. So my background before Devoted was in academic biostatistics. So I had a lot of experience working with clinicians who had questions like, we want to know if septic patients do worse in the hospital. And so then you have to have conversations like, what do you mean by do worse? Like, how are we going to measure that? And so now I work with our operations team, for example, and they're like, well, we want to make our process faster for this thing. And I'm like, OK let's break it down into a problem that I can actually examine with data, which requires a lot of data engineering, a lot of data wrangling. Um, but it's also a lot of translation, like translating those vague research or business questions into something that's answerable with the skills that you have. Um, I have a statistics background. I think much like Andrea, I, that is maybe what got me in the door as you know something that differentiated me. But those are the skills that I use literally every day, that translation. Great. Um, and so then moving on a little bit to um, to sort of your function at, at your in your team, um, to what extent do you think that, I mean, so there's, there's obviously a lot of different directions and a lot of ways that data scientists can specialize. Uh, and so, so to what extent do you think it's really useful for data scientists to specialize versus to, to, to stay a generalist? I think that depends on who you are. I like to be a generalist. It's where I'm happiest. I like having these different hats and these different roles that some days I'm in data all day and I'm like trying to make something work and then it does and it's like the best feeling. And other days I wanna be in meetings and talking to people and problem solving and trying to make those processes work. That's for me. Um, you may be somebody who loves to specialize and wants to be the best person at whatever algorithm. I think you have to really ask yourself, what types of questions do you like? I like big questions. Maybe you like specific questions. And then find your way in that company, in a field, that lets you live in that happy space for you. I don't know that there's one best answer. Is that okay? Do you, can I just ask, yeah. do you tend to think about sort of specializing versus generalizing in that divide of, of specializing, kind of working more on the technical side, and as, whereas a generalist is gonna be more sort of high level? I guess for me, that's how it's played out. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, there is, within that, it's like, it's like what scale are you talking about, right? right? Um, so at the scale where I'm happy, I'm both, I have one foot in the science and one foot out. Um, but you could have be with, fully within the science and still be somewhat of a generalist, yeah. It's funny because I think six months ago, my answer to this question would have been, yes, we need better titles. Because I think part of that was looking at job descriptions that just said data scientist. I'm like, I don't know if I'm what you're looking for with my background for this position. And so I would have said, yes, we need you know titles like machine learning engineer versus data visualization specialist and that, that kind of thing. Now, having been at a startup where the people we have doing analytics and metric setting now are the same people who are going to be doing you know, recommender building and that kind of thing in a few months. Like, I, my answer to that is very different because we do need a generalist, exactly. And so I feel like it needs to be um, specific to your situation, but the expectation needs to be clear both 
on what you're looking for as an individual and what the company or organization is looking for when they're hiring. So just hiring a general data scientist because we need somebody who works with data, we guess, uh, that's a recipe for disaster, so yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great point and uh, I completely agree. I think that understanding yourself and where you thrive is very, very important and that's the most important uh, question to answer. And from there you can look for opportunities that fit that bill and um, you know, if you're looking at a startup, uh, five people, 10 people, like under 100 people, you're gonna have to be a generalist. So if you know within yourself that you don't like being a generalist, don't look for a job at a small company because um, you're not gonna be very happy. So it's, I think that's why it's, it's, in, it's just so important to understand where you thrive to make sure that you're looking for those opportunities. This has so far been pretty focused on on the on my point of view as as the data scientist. Do you have any advice for um, from the company side uh, for if they're trying to get good people and you know how to? You mentioned Jennifer. You know the, the job description can be very vague and it's hard to know. But so, do you have any advice for people who might be putting together job descriptions or trying to build their their teams about what to look for and how to select? I can, I can chime in on that. Um, I, <laughs> I've done a lot of recruiting recently. So uh, I think it's, and, and it, for me it was important to also understand as kind of the person looking for to bring in people what I care about as well. And uh, what I've found at least for my, my company and my industry, I care about people caring about the industry. So I, I, I can get, you know, I, I put up a, a data analyst or data scientist job description and I'll get tens if not hundreds of resumes very easily, uh, which is part of, part of the conversation and why we're having that conversation. Uh, and most people just apply, it's like, oh, data science, apply, apply, apply. So one of the things that I, I added some friction to applying by asking people, what is your favorite video game? <laughs> And, and why? Because I, I want you to care about the industry. So I think like when, when you're on the other side is also understanding what you care about. Uh, and it might not be uh, video games and the industry. It might be, I want you to be passionate about um, how to problem solve in a certain way. So maybe I ask a question around that to get, um, as you're going through, as an applicant, you're going through that application form you can see like, oh, this is what the company cares about and uh, kind of saves time on both ends and a little bit of stress as well, like instead of just sending resumes on a void and, and hoping someone replies. Um, one thing that our leadership at Devoted and our data team has been really thoughtful about that I appreciate a lot is giving a lot of consideration to how we want to build a team and build a set of skill sets that overlap but also um, cover our bases, if you will. So for example, we've got a few people who are machine learning experts. Some of them have healthcare experience, some of them have never worked in healthcare. But between them, they have that machine learning aspect covered. And then we've got me with the statistical background. We've got other people who are more generalists. So like being very thoughtful about what you want your end result to be, and that will drive some of your hiring choices, I think. Could you speak a little bit to um, how, in, in your experience and in your opinion, data scientists can be most effective working with other parts of the organization that are, that are the non-data scientists? Uh, yeah, so I guess for me, I came into a, a data science team that was like fairly mature, and there were already relationships formed between a lot of the other teams that I have to interact with. And uh, that's been super valuable for me in that I don't have to like, convince anybody of the value of data science um, in my day to day. And so I think that friction is like not there for me, which um, has been very useful. Um, but I think in terms of like forging those relationships kind of over time, I think it's, it's very helpful to um, get to know your business partners or your engineering partners. And um, like for, for, for me, um, I have a couple of meetings per week with them, like a check-in at the beginning of the week and then an update meeting at the end of the week. And I think having that type of cadence with um, meeting and keeping an open line of communication um, has been very useful and trying to understand the perspectives that the, the different teams are coming from, what their goals are for the quarter, why they have those goals. 
um, has been very useful in just like making sure we're all aligned on the same goals and that we can support them and understand um, understand what uh, they're trying to, to do. Uh, so I think that's been helpful. Try to decide what exactly uh, to pick out. So like I said, um, this is a whole new process in our business and um, looking at some of the struggles that the data scientists have had, it was, there wasn't enough change management, which is a new term to me, essentially is that the, the business wasn't really ready to hear about a first run model. They heard data science, I got an answer, and they were like, that answer is different than what I know. The whole thing is wrong. Um, we didn't prepare them well enough to understand what a prediction meant. That it's not that we're gonna tell you the ground truth and that maps exactly what you know. So I think there's a lot of educating that needs to happen if that's a new part of the business. If you're actually adding data science to an existing business, which is different than a startup that is all data science. So I think being able to, to translate what it means that we can't predict the future if something hasn't happened before. Um, we can only predict what can happen in the future based on what has happened with the past. So I think getting that and getting those processes about how long is this gonna take? What does it mean to refresh the model? Like what are that, what's that cadence like? I think that's been really important. And as we've done more of that, our projects are going a lot more smoothly. Um, they're a lot more receptive. They're a lot less antagonistic to the idea of us coming in and telling them how to run their business because they're actually very good at what they do already. Um, so I think those are some of the critical things that I've learned in the past year. Uh, as, as you were talking, I was, I was thinking education. Um, so I, I definitely agree. I think that it goes both ways. It's, uh, and it's an ongoing process. So we have to educate um, you know, the, the business folks that you're working with on what you can and cannot do and why and be very, have just like an ongoing open dialogue and really um, help them understand what, what is feasible. And then on the engineering side as well, because you're, you're kind of bridging this gap between those, those worlds, right? And you're um, kind of occupying this very interesting space. And I think that's why a lot of people are fascinated by it. Um, and with, with your engineering uh, partners is also educating them about the business. So I found that the more context I give to the data engineers on how the work that they're doing is gonna impact the business, the more excited they get about the work that they're doing. So it's, it's kind of having that ongoing education and communication between the different uh, people that you're working with and the different groups that you're working with and being very clear with your words. And uh, someone was joking this week that if you hear some label, that probably Tammy labeled that thing, um, but it's, uh, we can call it predictions or projections or estimate. It's like what, if you can get a little bit more specific, a little bit more clear on what it actually means what it's actually capturing, you're gonna have a much easier time. It's gonna be a campaign on, on getting people to call the thing the, the, the way you want it to call, be, uh, call it. But once you get there, it just removes 50 questions at the beginning of the conversation of like, well, but does that, does that include this? And uh, when, like, how does it, what is, is a year from now, it's like, it's, it's like all those questions that people just ask at the beginning of the conversation, try to remove them by being very clear on what, um, how you're lab labeling things. I think it's so interesting to think about, like you guys have mentioned, about how, how the attitudes towards data scientists have changed within an organization over time. Um, and, and how people have thought about data science differently inside of an organization. Um, and could we also speak a little bit about how, in your experience, data science has changed, um, either either sort of specifically or more globally over the past few years, and maybe where you see it going and how you see it changing in the next few years as well? Who wants to start? <laughs> I, I think we're actually in a, in a pretty, um, exciting and terrible time for data science in that it's it's popular enough that everyone wants to do it as as companies like everyone's like data science i need that <laughs> ai i need that ml i need that i ju that it's just words that everyone's throwing and in successful businesses are doing it so if i want to be successful i i have to do it 
and um, that's it's it's exciting because it, you're going from resistance to people embracing the field and um, a way of running businesses, but it's terrible because they don't understand what it really is, and you're overdoing it. Um, I I often get questions about like, oh, can we do an AI model for that? And can we apply machine learning to that? I was like, you know how much time it's gonna take to do that? If I do a very simple dashboard and show trends over time, it's gonna give you 95% of the information that you need in, I can do that in an hour versus I don't know how many engineers um, to do that model that you want. So it's, that I think that's what's um, <laughs> kind of this, this frightening moment of everyone wants to apply uh, machine learning and, and AI to every single problem that they encounter because everyone's doing it. Um, so I think it's it's very interesting to see where it's going to go from here. Uh, and I think it starts with you know the people in the field uh, it, making sure that people are not overdoing it and people understand why and when to use certain. Uh, ways of thinking and problem solving and addressing um, questions. Yeah, I totally agree. I think um, AI is incredible, but it can't solve everything, right? It doesn't, I tell my business partners, is that it can't solve deep problems. It can't tell us um, everything in one algorithm. It's not going to tell us how to run your business. It can tell you one very specific thing. This model does one job, um, and we can have many models to tell us many different things. So I think um, I see it growing, and I think it's, it's, it's really exciting to be a part of it, but um, I don't want people to throw out the baby with the bathwater because um, they think it's going to solve their, all their problems right away, and it takes a lot of time and a lot of work to, to get some answers. And to give a, a I guess a, a specific example with um, I think like going forward, you've already seen a couple of companies popping up with the automated ML technologies and um, from the perspective of a data scientist, where part of what I do is modeling, it's like, is, is are these softwares going to come in and like replace our jobs? And I think, like, kind of going back to the, like one of the things I had said, like one of the skills I've taken from um, from my previous work, and I think is very been very important as a data scientist, is like knowing what questions to ask and how to apply models. And I think that's a piece that the like automated technology won't necessarily ever be able to fill. And so I think that still is like one of like you can have this toolbox, you can maybe replace it with a, like a software package that does all the modeling for you, but still knowing how to both come up with like how to apply the model and like what model to use, and then like how to interpret the results if you like deploy a model and compare it to another model, which model is the winner, and thinking through like how do I evaluate these models, I think are all still things that um, will be important for data scientists going forward. Um, and then like kind of echoing what everyone else on the panel has been saying too is like, do you need a model for this? Or can you answer the question with maybe like a very easy business rule by just looking at the data? Um, I think are all still things that like human power will, will be necessary for. So sort of along some similar lines um, is in terms of the influx, this great influx of of new data scientists into the field, there's so much. There is so much hype around around data scientists. Is is are there too many junior data scientists? Um, what are we and you, what are we doing well to train our incoming data scientists? And um, how can we improve on that? Yeah, it's uh, hard to say. I think probably not. Um, um, I think though, if you, I think maybe too many academic. There's a possibility, just in general trends of academia, there's a lot of academics and there's not a lot of academic positions. That's no, no secret, I hope. Um, but um, a lot of new fields are opening up to data science, right? I never would have predicted or thought like 18 months ago that I would end up from cognitive science and cog like developmental neuroscience in an asset management firm. Absolutely not. Um, but they welcome me with open arms. They think it's so exciting to have me, and I'm very, very happy there. So I think it was a lack of creativity on my part to think of where my skills could be applied. So as new fields and new technologies and new industries are opening up, um, we have many places to go. Um, even like supply chain, it turns out to be used a lot of data scientists too. Like all sorts of businesses 
um, need us. And so I think in that sense, we have plenty of homes to go to if we open our eyes to these new possibilities. Yeah, jumping on that a little bit, um, we do have a diversity here of people who have come kind of from academia with, with a PhD and those who haven't. And so I would, I would also, I think that's probably a big question for a lot of people getting into the field is, you know, do I need a PhD? How much, what from academia and from the academic experience is helpful and where, and does it, can it also hurt? I love that we're fighting over who um, is okay. going to be the nicest. Yeah, um, I feel like I have a strange perspective on this because um, for 13 years before I started this new role in January, um, I was in academics, but I did not have a PhD. And so I, I was in that culture and saw like the benefits of specialization that you get from academic, from traditional faculty work, but also was more of a generalist and applied statistician. And so um, I'm so sorry, I forgot what the question was. Is I it worth it to so get excited. a PhD? Yes, I would say no, obviously, um, but because I, I don't have one. Um, but I, I do think that there are some benefits, and I think you know if that sounds really fun to you, you're going to learn a lot doing that. Is that the only way that you're going to learn that? No, you're not. Um, I've learned so much both in my past roles and in this role um, without that PhD, and so you know that's a personal choice. I feel like. I would say, on, like coming from academia, I think one of the the downsides potentially is that you spend a lot of time thinking about one thing. Like doing a PhD, it's like five to six years thinking about one particular area and moving fairly slowly. Um, I think it it's been quite a change moving into data science, where the just the iteration cycle is much much faster. And I might not have to have like a very perfect thing with a really well written report at the end. It's more like I like very quickly iterate on something that's better, like do a quick write up, send out an email, uh, maybe like put together like a short report in a Google Doc and, and send it out. Um, and so the iteration cycle has been much faster compared to um, in um, academia where you'd spend a lot of time writing a paper, go through peer review. Um, if I'm presenting at a lab meeting, I'll spend time putting, like a lot of time putting together that presentation. Now I have to basically give a presentation like every week. And so the time I have to devote to that presentation has been much narrowed. And so um, just learning how to iterate much more quickly, I think, has been something that I've had to kind of learn on the job. Um, but I think from um, the like positives of coming from academia have been just I've spent a lot of time working with data and working with messy data. and learned that I really loved doing that through grad school. It's something if I, if I knew where I wanted to end up today, I would not recommend going through the PhD process. I think you can do that through other, other, other paths. Um, but I think like definitely trying, like whatever path you're coming from, trying to get that hands-on experience with messy data and coming up with your own problems, I think is a, uh, can be like very useful to figure out if you want to go into data science. Um, so I, I did, yeah, I got my PhD and it's allowed me to be successful at what I do, but I don't think it was the only way to have gained the skills. Um, like I taught a lot and that helped me in the communication. Um, being able to defend a dissertation like, lets me defend a lot of ideas and then have people question me all the time. Um, I've prepared for that. Um, but I think if you have a curiosity, if you want to ask those questions, I think you should go for it. I don't think you should be dissuaded from it, but I don't think it's the only path um, to get there. Um, and I don't think you should, if you want to become a professor in data science, like maybe more likely, but if that's not your job, you want to be in the field, like get in the field and, and, and get your hands on data. Cool. So I also want to um, give the audience a chance to ask questions. And so if anyone has questions, think about think about them. I'm going to ask one more, uh, which is just if you could, if anyone wants to talk about what brings you the most joy in your in your role right now. I'll start. The mic's right in front of me. Um, well, not the, there's little daily joys, and then there's like big joys of like completing something. The daily joys are when I'm trying to, I uh, make a lot of visualizations and I do a lot of dynamic things in Tableau. And so when I make the visualization like look exactly how I want to after going back to Alteryx and back to the, the visualization and it just like clicks and magically looks pretty, it's the best feeling in the world. <laughs> I put my arms up. Everybody knows that something good has happened when I, when I do that. So those little tinkering problem solving things bring me a lot of joy. 
I loved that Morgan put this on our list of questions and made me really happy. Um, and I totally agree. Like writing beautiful code, creating a, a beautiful data visualization, that gives me a great sense of joy. I think what really keeps me in this field is um, the ability to work with other people and solve important problems. That, you know, on a day to day basis, the code is great. On a global basis, for me, that is what keeps me here and keeps me really motivated. Uh, yeah, so for me, it is it is the the people's side as well, but the enabling people to make better decisions when when it clicks for someone that that is kind of a fantastic moment where they've been whether it's uh, I'm working with one of the the data analysts and they're struggling with a with a question and then all of a sudden it clicks and they're like oh my god you're amazing I was like I've just been sitting here asking questions. But that that being through that process, uh, it's uh, fin it's fantastic for me. And same thing for for business people of like, you know, working uh, with with our executive team and kind of figuring out how how do we improve the business and then problem solving and then it clicks and that you you see that change in in the person's attitude. That is um, just fantastic. Yeah, so for me, I think also the like people aspect of it, um, like within the data science team, uh, people are from all different backgrounds, so PhDs in like various fields like physics, bio, um, as well as masters, people coming from masters programs or people coming straight from undergrad. And so the, the mix is um, like pretty varied and it's cool to work with people with like very diverse backgrounds and brainstorming and, and um, if we like see some new um, new technique, like sharing papers about that, um, but also then interacting with our business partners um, who have also, again, very, very different backgrounds, maybe from like MBAs to uh, people just out of undergrad who are working as analysts, and just being able to collaborate with all of these people. We're working on like a, a common problem, um, being able to bounce ideas off of each other, and just working with very smart people has been really fun. So if anyone in the audience has questions, we can pass this out or I can repeat the question whenever it's easier. Okay. Hi, thank you for taking the time out of your work day to come, come talk to all of us. Um, so this is uh, on the topic of looking for a good data scientist within your um, respective companies. Um, in terms of skill sets that make a successful data scientist, you've all touched upon mostly soft skills, so you know, creative problem solving and communication. Um, and as an active individual trying to find a job, um, I, si I see that a lot of the requirements are more um, technical, so they'll say like have a master's or a PhD, um, and also going through the recruitment process, the actual like, filters are based on technical. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious um, how your respective companies are, I mean, also with the, excuse me, influx of like data scientists that are coming in, how are your respective companies filtering from those like hundreds of resumes that you're getting? Is it like a keyword pickup or are you actually, is there someone in your team that's sitting there and like looking through and saying like, okay, if this person doesn't have a master's, we're just gonna chuck it out. Like, can you, can you talk about that pipeline into what your experience of like recruitment is? Uh, yeah, so for, uh, personally for me, I review all the resumes and uh, that it's overwhelming at, at times. <laughs> so what, I, what I've done is, um, what I was mentioning, the, the pre-screen, like the, the form, it actually has a couple of questions that I really care about that are uh, the soft skills so that I can look at the resume, see the hard skills, look at the questions, see how much does this person care in my case about games and how do they communicate that? Because um, they're just, if someone just writes, I like uh, Mario Kart because it's super fun, I'm <laughs> like, cool, yes, that's, that was the goal. But I, I want people to like, if you're, if you're in data and you wanna go into games, I want you to be analyzing it. Uh, and that shows me also that uh, kind of thought process and uh, I usually look for uh, one hard skill around uh, manipulating data, whether it's SQL, Python, R. Uh, as I said, I, don't, I, I truly believe that you can pick up whatever we're using, which is we, we use SQL and Python. Um, you don't need it. Like I, 
my best um, data scientist right now, he was very nervous to apply because he didn't have any, uh, like SQL, he, he used to struggle with SQL, but he was very good with uh, Python. In a matter of three weeks, he's no problem with SQL, like he's just running. So it's a matter of like, were you using it in the right uh, way with the right data? You're smart, you can kind of answer and, and uh, ask and answer questions. So that for me is like, look for one hard skill um, to make sure that you know you've you've learned, and uh, we also have a, a a test after the uh, phone screen, so that also helps with the hard skills. I I was a, a hater of uh, homeworks or, or a kind of like those those take home things for for interviews uh, until I applied to my company many years ago and. I got one that was very like I was like oh this is what I'm gonna be doing every day like they didn't just give me like solve this very generic problem and see if you're smart it was like very like applicable it was like they gave me data in that in that time as marketing data they gave me marketing data they asked me how I would optimize campaigns how I would uh, generate a report and it was a very I was like okay that's what I'm gonna be doing every day. This is exciting. I know what their expectation is, and uh, that's how I try to also build the case studies that uh, we we give to people as part of the interview. I tell them, open it up, and if you get excited about um, going at it, it's that you should feel that. If you don't, just let me know. No hard feelings, but don't try to just power through it. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> I just Have all your keywords right on your resume for the big companies. <laughs> just, just so that you stand out, because yes, like we and we've started using software that I can put in, like highlight the keywords on the resume, so I don't have to like read every single line. So yes, figure out what the keywords are and, and throw them into your resume. <laughs> um, just kind of related note. Um, my sympathies. It sucks to apply for jobs. It's like the worst thing, um, and I just. Uh, I actually sat on my admissions committee when I was in grad school, and I just would say that there were so many people who were like worthy and, and should have gone to grad school, and we only had so many positions. So just remember that just because you don't get a job doesn't mean you weren't qualified and you weren't going to be great in that job. You know, there's all these other things that are happening. Um, so just keep applying and just stay strong because it sucks. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks for your time and for your sharing. And I have a question. Like, would you mind talking more about like what should be the long-term career path for data scientists? Because, you know, a lot of auto ML and uh, those um, automatic like uh, parameter tuning softwares comes out, and definitely the trend in the future. So, in this situation, how we position ourselves in the market or in the industry, how we do our long-term job uh, or career planning. Thank you. Um, one thing that I've learned is that I will never be done learning. And so, like, and I think if we get too attached to specific algorithms or tools and that kind of thing, like, I programmed in R for 13 years. Our current tech stack does not have R in it. So I am learning Python right now. And that's, a, it's an identity shift sometimes if you let it. And so my advice would be, just to learn the concepts, you know, learn the fundamentals, and recognize that you're always going to be learning new tools, and that's part of what makes it exciting. And that will be that will totally better prepare you for whatever happens in the market long term. Um, and I guess just quickly, another thing, like for thinking long term career paths, um, I think there, the, from my experience, there's been kind of a split with like this diverging path where you can decide to either become an independent contributor and continue like heads down science. Uh, or you can do the managerial track, and uh, I think those two paths look quite different, and like what you would do in your long term would definitely depend on what track you're taking. Uh, but I think in either path, like keeping learning and keeping, uh, even if you don't know exactly how to implement the newest, shiniest algorithm, having like a 
general understanding of, of what it is, I think is also probably a good thing. Hi. So it's not every day that so many women with quantitative backgrounds are in the same room. Um, and so I'm wondering if you feel like you've faced any special obstacles relating to being a woman and getting to where you are today. And if you adapted or how you adapted and responded to those obstacles. Um, yet no, but probably. Like that's, um, <laughs> I have no clear memory of somebody walking up to me and being like, you don't belong here, but um, I'm sure we all know about unconscious bias and stereotypes and all these things. I'm sure people have wondered. Um, I'm also a, pers I'm a minority, so there's also that component of my existence. Um, and I've you know, questioned that, but it's this weird thing where it's, I, I don't believe that you should like be the best just to prove them wrong. I'm gonna be the best because I wanna be good at what I do. And so that's been my philosophy moving forward in my career is just own what I have, be good at it. And um, if somebody stands in my way, I'll try to get through them. If not, I'm just gonna keep moving this way. Like, you're fine, I don't wanna deal with you. You you don't need me, I don't need you. I'm gonna go be awesome over here um, and keep moving. So that's my philosophy on being a woman. And I just, I want more of us. I want so much more of us. Uh, so I, I I like to say I'm incredibly lucky because my company, even though in the gaming industry, most companies are 10, 20% women, my company, the CEO is a woman. She's super quantitative, um, so she nerds out with me on, on all things data, uh, and I'll, will ask the nitty gritty questions, and it's fantastic for me uh, because she's kind of been a trailblazer in, in that sense, and like she, but it, it was really just guts and being confident that she was a smart woman and you know she's five feet tall so it's even like being even more confident about it but you know you're smart and you know that you know what you're talking about and that really is the key is just own that I'm smart I know what I'm talking about and that's that's all you need that's and it maybe you get some some roadblocks along the way but if you're confident on your knowledge and um, yourself, then you can push through those roadblocks. Hi, uh, thank you for your sharing. So building on uh, the answer that Stephanie answered about our personal long career, a uh, long term career uh, progression, you mentioned the IC track as well as the management track. So I saw that some of the panelists are actually like a leader in the company. So I'm just wondering, uh, early in your career, how do you decide, like in the future, do you want to pursue an IC track to be like a principal data scientist one day or start to manage people? And uh, what are some qualities or characteristics that make you think that you will be a better fit for either manager role or an IC role? For me, it's uh, going back to what sparks joy on your day to day. If uh, you know, getting that perfect, beautiful code and going very deep on a problem and and getting kind of the ability to explore that uh, problem space and answer the questions is what brings you the most joy. Uh, not to say that you shouldn't explore if you know a manager path might be good for you, but it starts giving you that information of, you know, the the IC track is probably what's gonna be the best fit for my myself and my personality and where I find uh, the most joy. If, you know, bouncing around ideas and, and mentoring other people, and like that's a good way to like learn if, if you would be a good manager in terms of liking it and, and connecting with people and thriving is, uh, look for opportunities where you can mentor others um, and see if, if that clicks for you. And uh, it's really just playing around with, with those different uh, skills and see where you find that you really want to, to spend most of your time. Because um, 
I, I have seen a lot of people go from being a fantastic individual contributor to a terrible manager and being very unhappy uh, because that's the only way that they can grow their career and that is a terrible mindset um, that a lot of companies have. But, you know, it, it is, a, in some places it is a reality, but you should not get to that place of, oh, I, I'm going to be a manager just because that's the only way I can move on. And this actually is <laughs> going to go in a little bit of a tangent. This is something that my, my dad taught me, and he's an electrical engineer, and he shifted, like, he changed jobs at some point uh, pretty late in his career because, of, like, this company, the only way I can move on is be a manager, and I hate it. So I'm going to look for another job where they let me be the best engineer I can be. All right, we have two minutes. Um, can we wrap up just by giving you know one or two sentences of final take-home advice um, that you give to the audience? Um, I guess for the audience, for especially for people who like want to get into the data science field, um, I would say just like try to get your hands on as much data as possible and um, and have fun with it. <laughs> Uh, I'll I'll go with the have fun with uh, whatever you're doing. Don't don't do it because it's exciting and, and uh, the shiny new thing. Do it because you're having fun while you're doing it. Um, I would say know yourself. Get to know yourself, and I feel like that will guide a lot of the answers to the questions we talked about. Like, should you get a PhD? That depends. Um, should you be an IC or manager? That depends. So the better you know yourself, what makes you happy, what you're good at. Um, the, more, the happier you're going to be. I guess to follow up, I say stay present. I think you should be looking, you know, there is a future ahead of you and you want employment and maybe retirement money at some point, you know, those, those real life things. Um, but uh, you can't predict the jobs that are in the future, right? What you can do, what you can control is what you're doing now. And if you're focused, I, well, I guess I should say, I have had a problem where I've been so, fo so, focused, so focused on the future I wasn't being good at what I was doing now because I was so worried about the future. And so that made the future harder when I got there because I wasn't as prepared. So um, my advice is just to stay present, um, do what you love and, and really get enmeshed to that and the future will, will take care of itself. Yeah, thank you so much to our panelists and to Morgan Taylor for moderating. So now let's take a 15-minute break. There's coffee and snacks outside, but please be back in 15 minutes for our next speaker. <laughs>